<laughs> Sorry about that. Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the fourth night of the Ethnic Heritage Program of the Four City Area Historical Society. This year, the Four City Area Historical Society is joining with the 250th anniversary of the Anthracite community to celebrate the coal industry which brought the people and prosperity to the Four City area. In the last three nights, we have had almost 150 area people enjoy our different ethnic programs. Monday night, Charlie Compass, who is here tonight, I noticed. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. He gave an excellent presentation on anthracite mining and miners. And Charlie is with the uh, Lackawanna County Historical Society. Thanks, Charlie, again. It was fun. <laughs> Tuesday night, Alan Gordon told us about his life growing up in a Polish family in Forest City. And last night, Stephanie Longo, founder of the Northeastern Pennsylvania Italian Heritage Group, highlighted the Italian heritage of the Lackawanna Valley. I would like to mention that all of the presentations we have this week are being videotaped by the member Dale Kecklock. And we'd like to thank you, Dale, for doing all this. And they will be put on our website so you can be viewed at a later date. Tonight, we are honored to have Carol Gargan, a neighbor from Uniondale County. No, Elkdale, am I right? John, Elkdale, it's right over the hill. I don't believe that, Carol. Uniondale Civic uh, Trust, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> she's going to talk, talk to us tonight about the contributions of the Lithuanians to the culture and heritage of the Four City area. Carol Gargan is a retired Pennsylvania public school art teacher. She earned a PhD in art education from Penn State and an MFA from Goddard College. Throughout her career, she has created and pursued interdisciplinary programs in the arts and sciences, a symposium on the environment and the creative imagination, and a symposium at Penn State, State College, between artists, scientists, and philosophers. Since retiring, she organized a Chicago program that features local history in the arts as well as musical production of her original play, Beacon Fires. She organized five Lithuanian Heritage Days at the Anthracite Heritage Museum in Scranton and featured programs on history and the arts. For the past 12 years, she has devoted her time and energy to the development of a memorial garden in Scranton to Lithuanians and Lithuanian Americans. <coughs> the Koskios, Kos, Koskoski, Kokusko? Koshushko. Koshushko, excuse me. If, if you ever saw how it's spelled, you really wouldn't know how to pronounce it. Okay. At the Koshushko Healing Garden, a sister garden to the American Revolutionary leader Thaddeus Koshushko's garden at West Point. And I'd also like to point out that most recently, Carol has presented the Lithuanian ambassador to the United States with the Bernadette Slick's book on Lithuanian history of Forest City. I thought well, that was a very nice thing to do. So thank you so much. And we'd like to welcome Carol Gardner. First, a couple of things I have to say first. This is probably the most beautiful historical society building I've ever been in. I, I love the idea that you guys have taken a church that's empty and left and turned it into something where people come together and learn about themselves and their community and even a larger world. Um, the other thing is the thing that he has worked that the historical society has organized for Saturday, where all these different ethnicities are going to get together and have a parade and walk together in, the, in their outfits and everything. I mean that is that is just fantastic. I mean I haven't heard of anybody doing anything like that. Maybe one particular group or something, but this is everybody. This is the way it was in Forest City. So it's just, I mean, the last time that happened, when, what, when George Mitchell, Mitchell was the <laughs> president of the United Mine Workers or something? I mean, I think that's just a fantastic thing that the Historical Society is doing. Um, I'm honored to present this today and hope you enjoy it. I hope I uh, do honor my heritage. Uh, I've got my 
shirt on, uh, <laughs> American grown, but Lithuanian roots. So, and that fits with the garden, too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I had my DNA done, though, so there's, it's quite a mixture. But mostly Eastern European, so. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm trying to think of where I really wanted to start. Uh, I also want to give a little tip of the hat here before I start to the original people that were here, uh, which were the American Indians. Um, I don't, there's not a program here, but boy, there's going to be an excellent program on August 13th if anybody's interested in that history. Um, where the Lackawanna meets the Susquehanna River down by Pittston, there's a uh, an amazing archaeological dig that has been going on for, um, well, quite some time. The Francis Dorrance Archaeology Chapter is working down there. And they have found Native American artifacts at that site that go back to 10,000 BC. Wow. So it's not a joke, <laughs> it's for real. Um, and you can go down there. They usually have programs several times a year. I mean, I'm sure the program on uh, August 13th down at Pittston. I'm sure the slide presentation or whatever they have will show some of those artifacts and they'll probably have some on display. Um, but the point I'm trying to get across to you is that, look, just think of time. And I think this is what is really getting me lately is, is the sense of time as I get older. I'm in my 70s now. Um, so you start thinking about time maybe more as you get older and how fortunate you are even to hit 70, okay? And still be able to be here talking and presenting something to you um, that I love and am passionate about, okay? But when you think about the fact that those people were here 10,000 BC, just, just think about that time element. And some of the things I've read about, uh, if you go down to the Pittston area, there were and I think about the Lackawanna River, and this city is so extremely important with the Lackawanna River because the two branches come together right, a, right above Forest City and become one and become the Lackawanna River here. And that goes all the way down to Pittston. But when you think about that river and you think about the time that the shad were running and the eel were running, you didn't need welfare. You didn't have to have welfare if you knew how to fish. You could save yourself and your family by just going to the river and fishing, okay? And then we came and, into the Industrial Revolution and things changed. You can't fish, when you can fish now, thanks to the efforts of a lot of people, like the Lackawanna River Corridor Association, Rails to Trails is, is getting uh, awareness of the river going. But years, and just think of the time element. You could, you could catch shed in that river probably to about 1880. But it's not now, you can't get them now. And that, we have to think about that because that's a way of, I mean, this historical society, everything, just think of the small amount of time. It's like 100 years and it's all changed. And the Native Americans were here for like from 10,000 BC and lived off of those things. Okay, down by Pittston also, you, they found, um, they're called middens, M-I-D-D-E-N-S. Has anybody ever heard that word before? Middens are deposits of shellfish. Usually if you're eating shellfish, you go to a clam bake, you have a lot of shells left. For thousands of years, they lived off freshwater mollusks, shellfish, and you, at one point, the, it was 12 feet deep and six feet wide along the edge of the river. It's all gone now because of flooding, railroad built construction, and everything else. But that shows you how the river sustained people with the, with the mollusks, with the fish, eels, which are also fish. So let's think about how that has drastically changed you know, within a hundred years, how drastically we have changed it. And things like historical societies and the rail to trail and conservancy groups, you have panther bluff native plants close to here, don't you? Yeah. yeah. I haven't been there now, I'm real, I just heard about it. I really am anxious to see that place. That's fantastic that you have something like that here. It's so special. Uh, your environment here is so special because of the rivers and the waters. 
Um, I just conserved my land, which is a little bit smaller. I understand Panther Bluffs is about seven acres. Mine is about six. Um, I don't have as beautiful an area with water and wetlands, but I think conserving and thinking about who's coming after us is just as important, especially as, as I am getting ready to do my last act and leave. So I want to leave it uh, as best as I can. Okay, so that's my little sermon and my little tip of the hat to the people that were here first. <laughs> I consider Forest City a guardian city. Like I consider you guys the first guardian of the Lackawanna River. That was my, that's my name for you. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'll have to use this. Lithuanian American coal miners in northeastern Pennsylvania by the granddaughter of Lithuanian American coal miner, Karolius. Karolius was my grandfather. And I'm named after him, I'm Carol. That would be the English version of the Lithuanian name Karolius. Um, Pope, uh, Pope John Paul was also Carol. <coughs> Who were these foreigners? Um, if you're not Lithuanian, it's kind of a little bit interesting to understand a little bit about where they came from. And I start with this, which isn't really Lithuanian, but I came across this, and I just find this absolutely amazing. It's from the Bronze Age, 3200 BC. Um, it was in the Scandinavian area, but it gives you a good idea of the type of burials that were going on at that time. That's literally a tree trunk for a coffin. You didn't have a pine box, you used the tree. Uh, inside are the clothing of a woman and some jewelry and her uh, uh, there's other things like berries. There's a little basket of berries. That's another picture. You can see the animal hide that her body was on. And this helps you a little bit more. But what blew me away with this was 3200 BC. This is my grandmother's sash from Lithuania. And it's almost like that sash. So it shows how we really are connected. You know, we might think that we are, we're so different. I think what's different is we don't have fish in the river, okay? We need welfare. Um, so this is the one she brought over from Lithuania. She came about 1906, so this probably was made in the 1800s, late 1800s. And this one is of wool. The, the ones pictured here were made of linen. My grandmother also grew flax. She transformed it into thread, and then she wove it, wove it into tablecloths and whatever else they needed to have for the kitchen. I wanted to mention this, too, because one of my favorite Lithuanian uh, people is a woman named Marija Gimbutas. She's an anthropologist. She's deceased now. I always wished I could have met her. Uh, her writings about the Bronze Age and that, and that time prehistory are just astonishing. Uh, when she first came out with all of them, people criticized her and didn't agree with her theories and everything. And now they're through DNA. Now that she's not here anymore, they're proving her right. So it's just an amazing story if anybody's interested in that. But this is one of my favorite quotes from her. Nurturing or dominating, our, well, no, this isn't her quote, but this is, let's see. This is her quote. I reject the assumption that civilization refers only to androcratic warrior societies. The generative basis of any society lies in its degree of artistic creation, aesthetic achievements, non-material values, and freedom, which make life meaningful and enjoyable for all its citizens, as well as a balance of powers between the sexes. So it's, it's just talking about, and then up here, this quote, it talks about old civilizations, the Chinese, 3,600 years, three and a half millennia, Ice Age images. If you know about Ice Age art, if you went to France or Spain, you can go in the caves and you can see these images that are absolutely stunning. 
Those images come from 30,000 BC. So think about this. The images endured four times as long as all recorded history. The culture it served must have been deeply satisfied and stable to a degree it is hard to, for modern humans to imagine. Could you imagine a culture lasting 30,000 years? I mean, how, how could people be that stable? We think about ourselves as progress and advancing really fast, but I think we have to think about some of the drastic changes that we're doing along, along with it. And what are our priorities? I think our priorities are to take care of each other and the world around us. So this is a map that gives you an idea of the size of Lithuania in Europe today, right here. Ah, you can't see. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, it's pretty small. Now there should be another map. On the map on the left, you see the original, the size of Lithuania at its highest point. It stretched from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, all the ways to basically where Crimea and uh, Ukraine, where we have problems today. And then after the various wars and everything with different, uh, over the centuries, it's now the size it is there, which I just showed you previously. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm going to just go back to that other one. Part of the reason Lithuania was able to stretch to the Black Sea, Lithuania was a guardian, uh, guarded people. Slavery was an extremely big industry at the time. People from the East came and pillaged all that whole area of Central Europe and got white slaves. Crimea, Kaffa, was, in, was the slave port in Crimea. Lithuanians were hired to protect the people in this area from being taken as slaves. So we think of slavery in our country, but if you really look up the history of slavery, there was a long period of time when white people were the prized slaves. I don't think too many people even know that. Um, and Lithuania was the, a guardian warrior nation that protected the people from being taken as slaves. If you listen to Ukrainian songs or Ruthenian songs, there are a lot of songs, even in Lithuanian too, not so much because they were the, the original part of Lithuania is up further, but as a guardian nation, they guarded all those other groups of people. And the folk songs really talk about being taken as slaves. Okay. In all of Lithuania, there may not be a single village from which someone has not run off to America. Someone going off to America is an ordinary occurrence, like rain in the summer or snow in the winter. Uh, this was written by Vinkas Kudirka, who's a very good writer in Lithuania. You could tell by the poeticness of that statement. He also wrote the Lithuanian National Anthem. His brother actually came over and uh, lived down in the Wilkes-Barre area. <clears throat> okay, this is a picture of uh, my uncle would be my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, Anthony. And I, I'm always amazed when I see these pictures too. He's so proud to be a coal miner. He's got a suit on. <laughs> he's got a suit on, he's got his miner's cap on. He's so proud that he's a miner over here and he's gonna earn enough money and he's gonna save his family over in Lithuania or bring them over. He's gonna accomplish something over here. And he, he, they would take these pictures, they would send them back. As they saved enough money, they would bring people over. This is a picture of my grandmother and a friend of hers. And this, I don't think they owned these outfits, but they would go to the photographer, and probably the suit on my great uncle was not his either. Maybe it was. But they would go to the photographer, and they would have these clothes that you could dress up in and then you would send these back. And the women, a lot of times, had these taken and sent back to try and find a husband. <laughs> so you really wanted to doll it up. <laughs> well, she found a husband, my grandfather, here, though. She didn't find him in Lithuania, as far as I know, because he came in 1902. And this is the wedding picture, which is quite a big uh, wedding picture. 
look at me. <laughs> and other people in there are a, a cousin. Um, two of her brothers are in the picture. Why does she have fair feet and gloves? I keep asking people that, and if anybody knows why the feet are on pillows, I have no idea. If anybody knows why, I have no idea. Except that, yeah, and it's the two women in the front, so I have no idea. I've asked a million people what custom that is. The bride and bride. Yeah, the, the bride of honor, the maid of honor and the bride. Why they came, and I have a whole other thing on this, but we'll just go over a little bit. Uh, depopulation, where was the depopulation? The depopulation was here. You have to realize the American Civil War wiped out a whole generation of American men. And they needed, they needed labor after the Civil War. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was taking off, and where were they going to get the people to build the jobs? Issues in America, we had the Civil War, which caused the end of <coughs> slavery. Issues over there were very similar. They had rebellions and wanted the end of serfdom, which in a way was a type of slavery. Uh, you would be sold with the land. Inducements, okay, we're gonna get into this more. Uh, we have different notions about immigration. I know I always heard that my grandfather came to escape the, the Russian draft uh, and things like that, and I'm sure a lot of people heard that. But there were inducements, too. There were advertisements, uh, there were organizations, there were private agencies, there were governments, national, federal, and state. Uh, Pennsylvania State sent agents to Europe. Um, coal companies sent representatives to Europe, especially port cities where the people came in from the different countries. Uh, there was a contract labor act right after the Civil War, 1864 to 1868. Um, that's where you signed up almost like an indentured servant to work off your passage. Um, federal in 1891, I believe, was the beginning of the immigration, the Bureau of Immigration, under the auspices of the Treasury Department. Then it became the Department of Labor. Shipping companies, if you study the history of shipping companies, that's intriguing in itself. The Hamburg American Line was one of the biggest. They built gigantic immigration halls. If you go over there today, you can visit them. Uh, the Albert, ba I think it's Ballin, was one of the big movers for the housing and all for the thousands of immigrants that were shipped from there. Um, his business began to fall apart at the beginning of uh, World War II, he committed suicide. So despite the millions and millions of dollars he had, it's really interesting too to watch what happens to people who are extremely rich. Things change and it's, it's not as easy. Okay, there's parallels to what goes on with uh, situations even here. The serfs had to work for the landlord, as usual, even after their freedom, for two years. The nobles kept nearly all the meadows and forests. They had their debts paid by the state, with the ex-serfs paid 34% over the market price for the shrunk shrunken plots of land they kept. So do you see what happens? Even though they're free, they have to pay for what they got. And different sections had to pay a lot more. Uh, overseas, Lithuanians played an important part in the struggle for Lithuanian's freedom. Following the insurrection of 1863, several factors stimulated a growing stream of immigration, political persecutions, agrarian upheavals, and the brutal suppression of the revolution of 1905. These are all different things that happened in Lithuania. Probably the revolution of 1863, that's when they started leaving uh, in, in larger uh, numbers. Also, you had the beginning of railroads. It was easier for them to escape. That revolution in 1905, though, that was in the Russian Empire, right? Yeah, it was, so all, it was all of them were. Yeah, so was Lithuania part of Russia? At, at 1905, yeah. Okay, because I knew, you know, Poland and Lithuania were a confederation for a couple hundred years <clears throat> or something. Yes, yeah, right. But, I mean, Leo Nadzak was a barber in Browndale, and he said one time, I asked him, when I was just a little kid, Leo, why'd you come over here? And he said, well, 
the, the Russian government wanted to make him a soldier, so years, he yeah. had to get the hell out of there. And I said, well, how come you can speak so many languages? He goes, well, the border was moving all the time. Yeah. Amazing. It was necessity. <coughs> My grandmother spoke about five languages. They usually spoke Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, German, German. and then yeah. English. Wow. I mean, just, just to survive, you had to kind of do, learn all that. I'm new to this. Sure. Has anyone ever heard of Antonis Atona? Yeah. Anthony okay. Bagdonis? Was he bad? <laughs> <laughs> Antonis Bagdonis? No, Smetona. Oh, Smetona? He was the president for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That was my well. husband's uncle. Wow. Well, yeah, his mother was the, either the sister or the niece of him. Well, and that's a pretty, impo that's a pretty important so name. <laughs> yeah. So he snuck out. Son was living in Ohio or something. I think it might have been Illinois. I'm not sure where he, he died. Lived for a while. But one yeah, of the, one of yeah he had a flea. He had a flea. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of revolutionary oh, movements. I find out more. I just well, I don't know. I don't know an awful lot about Smetona. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> Are they in English? I hope they're in English because I can't read Lithuanian. And people give me things in Lithuanian, and I just I wish I did know the language. I'm not sure. And my husband's so proud of it because he says, "Gee, I guess we were something to do with what they were." Oh yeah, no, definitely. If he was the president of Lithuania, I think that's pretty important. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'll, we, we can talk. Thanks for sharing that. Smetona was one of the early presidents when Lithuania be, uh, got its freedom after World War I. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention was education, uh, because this is where things really change for, between the Poles and the Lithuanians. Uh, the Poles were allowed to keep their language. The Lithuanians were not. Uh, they could not use the Roman alphabet for their language. They had to use the Cyrillic alphabet, and things were in Russian. So the only place they really had the ability to use their language, can you guess? Church. church. Yeah, it was church. So you can imagine the ferocity that they had about church. <laughs> that was like the place where they could use their language. And the priest a lot of times gave the, the sermons, I guess in Lithuanian too, but when they could answer it with their songs, the singing was the most important thing to them. It was the absolute most important thing. And their education was done largely in secret. This is called the Lithuanian school. And the reason it's called that is because what I just said, it was done in secret. They had book smugglers. A lot of the books they had, especially after they started coming over here, one of the first things that the Lithuanians did was they had printing presses and they started printing like crazy, okay? And they sent the things, the newspapers, magazines, books, they sent them back to Lithuania and they had book smugglers. These are two very famous statues in Lithuania that honor that the way the Lithuanians resisted the Russians by teaching the children with these uh, illegal books, you know, printed in their language that the book smugglers smuggled uh, back into Lithuania. This is uh, one of the ma early magazines. This one came out of, uh, they were allowed to print this in Germany, Ausra, and it was, that's called Dawn. A couple of the people that started this magazine came to Pennsylvania. Alexander Berba and uh, Schlupas. He lived in Scranton, and Berba lived mostly in Plymouth. They did move around quite a bit, though, initially. I wanted to tell you about this. If you go to the New York City Public Library, uh, check this out. Uh, this is a Lithuanian immigrant who came here didn't have much education, but self-taught at the New York Public Library. When he died, 
he donated his whatever money he had, and he had made quite a lot of money in the stock market, believe it or not. Wish I could have the genius that these people have. <laughs> Inscribed here are the words of an immigrant whose life was transformed by the library and whose estate now enriches it. Martin Radke. I had opportunity, I had little opportunity for formal education as a young man in Lithuania, and I am deeply indebted to the New York Public Library for the opportunity to educate myself. In appreciation, I have given the library my estate with the wish that it be used so that others can have the same opportunity made available, can have the same opportunity made available to me. Fifth Avenue entrance to the New York Public Library, you can see what a Lithuanian did. That's how much they valued education. Uh, I also love the fact that the <coughs> Lithuanian Memorial Garden that I have in Scranton is right in back of the Silkman House, which was the library I went to as a child. It's uh, part of the Scranton Public Library. Uh, he was born in Klaikeda. He was a gardener, too, by the way. <laughs> That's how he earned his money. He was a gardener for the wealthy. Yeah, okay, too. It's just amazing. His records uh, from 1914 to 1940, on his records say German, Prussian, Swedish, Austrian, Russian, Polish. But when he died, his plaque he made sure it said Lithuanian. This is one of the things you're going to find when you look up records. You will find all of these designations for Lithuanians because, that, because there was so, so many different, like, it was like the ocean, you know, waves. One day you're Russian, the next day you're Polish, the next day you're German because of all the different uh, wars and things that went on. That's where I got the records for him. It's interesting to think about this. An act to encourage immigrants was signed July 4th, 1864, the first and only major law in American history to encourage immigration. Again, you can see the connection to the Civil War. <coughs> the Republican Party's 1864 platform encouraged liberal and just policy on immigration. There's a lot more there. We're going to spend all our time. This is the American Immigrant Company. It was actually a corporation that published a book. You can read this book online. It tells you how to go overseas and establish uh, contact to get the immigrants. It's interesting how our feelings change about immigration. <laughs> this is interesting too. Um, Terrence Powderly, there's Powderly Street in uh, Carbondale. He was at one time the head of the Knights of Labor and was in charge of a lot of these incredible strikes that were quite brutal and eventually became the first head of immigration in the United States. Under President William McKinley, he appointed Powderly as the Commissioner of General Immigration. He also took gorgeous pictures of the immigrants when they entered the port of Baltimore. This is a copy of a typical contract between a shipping company, this is the White Star Line contract, and an immigrant. Uh, I don't know if any of you have anything like that. I don't have anything like that for my family, but boy, I wish I did. And all the different conditions. And There's an advertisement. This is, not, uh, this is an advertisement from Wales. On the right is like a postcard that Jewish immigrants here sent back to try and encourage their families to come to the United States. The flow. The first were blown across oceans by the wind, then propelled by the steam, created from the coal their relatives mined as pumps drained the underground water for them to mine further and deeper. And we realized that the end of coal mining here happened when they shut the pumps off and the water went in. So people don't realize that the balance between the river and the mine is also vital. Mines will either succeed or fail half the time if the water, if the water gets in, you have to pump that water out. This is interesting because it's a book written by a, a Lithuanian immigrant. He came here, eventually he went back. 
and it was called the Lithuanian Colonies. I got a kick out of that, the Lithuanian <laughs> Colonies in Pennsylvania. Four cities on there, you're one of the Lithuanian Colonies. <laughs> <laughs> this is from 1897. It's all in Lithuanian. I tried reading it. It's just uh, really difficult. This was, I did get this part out of the book, and this is the front part. He's, he's trying to get people to come to the area too. All around, you see the view is harsh and unattractive. There are no cultivated fields, and instead of forests, you see only stunted shrub growth. But now, as you come to the last hill, Take a look through the window of the speeding train at the beautiful scene coming into view. Below is what is called the Wyoming Valley. It meanders the familiar Susquehanna River, both banks of which are lined with houses and cottages and towns. Lithuanians live in all of them. <laughs> Here, all along the riverside are the coal mines. A little bit of exaggeration there. <laughs> But he's trying to get them to come, assuring them that when you get here, it's all at the way. <laughs> I, I will say Forest City did have one of the highest populations and concentrations of Lithuanians. Uh, this is a typical agent. Uh, this is John Shigo from Freeland, PA. Mine operators even hired agents to go to Europe and recruit workers. I, this is really interesting because um, this is from the Plymouth uh, newspaper, I believe. No, it looks very record, but it's about the, the first play uh, that was written and performed in the United States by a Lithuanian. And they're going to say Polish in here, even though you see the word Dienbe Litu. I can't even make that out. The Tuvis, the Tuvinke. Okay, so it's really Lithuanians, but they're still kind of calling themselves Polish, okay? You're going to see the name Pouch this in there, too, and I understand you had a um, priest that was Pouch this. a um, teacher. Yeah, well, they were probably related. But uh, read what he says. The first two acts are in Lithuanian, and the plot of the play goes to show how the unwary Pole, okay, is imposed upon by wicked men in this country who are devoid of conscience and whose only aim is to seize every opportunity to defraud the unsuspecting foreigner. It shows how they are influenced to immigrate to America and what inducements, I can't make that one up, are held out. The third act is the poor immigrants' experience in America. So it's interesting to see their perspective. <coughs> and this was done in the late 1800s. Uh, somebody at one point wanted me to give numbers of how many people ca that came. And the numbers are, as I said, they call themselves Russians, Poles, Prussians, Germans. The numbers vary because you can't get it really exact. Only around 1900 did they officially start calling themselves Lithuanians. Uh, so in a 2009 article, 1885 says there was 15,000 MPA. Mm -hmm. Zelenskis in that book claims that by 1898 there were 27,000. Another publication said 28. By 1915, 80 to 90,000. And below you see the statistics from the US Immigration Service, 252,000. The top ones are just for Pennsylvania, by the way. Uh, 28, I think, and 15. 60 to 75,000, that's a lot of immigrants. One fifth returned. They originally came over here thinking they'd get rich and go back and buy land, but only one-fifth returned. 1870 to 1920, a good round number would be 600,000. One-sixth the population of a nation that was not even on the map, a nation that had been divided between Russia, Prussia, and Austria three times since the Kosciuszko uprising in 1794. Those who came here helped put it back on the map and many resided in the Wyoming Valley, and uh, one resided right here in Forest City. It's interesting to see how they were described in different writings. Uh, I just put these three up, chose these three, because it really shows you 
you really have to do a lot of reading and thinking and trust your own experience and your own judgment to come to conclusions. You can't just listen to one thing. Catholic Encyclopedia. There are comparatively few Lithuanian farmers in America, and these have not been very successful. And I think, I was in Forest City. Well, there's the Satunases, they're pretty successful. The Rug Balls were pretty successful. There's a lot of successful Lithuanian farmers out here. Um, so I don't agree with that. All attempts to colonize them in Arkansas, Illinois, Wisconsin, and New York have failed. Generally speaking, the Lithuanians prefer to be employed in factories, closed shops, and mines. I don't agree with that. My grandfather worked in the mines, and he wound up being a, a powder man, which is you dynamite the granite first so you can get to the coal, which is a more dangerous <coughs> job, and you get white lung instead of black lung, and you die quicker. And he did die quicker. Um, so they wanted the money. They wanted the money because when they got the money, the first thing they did, they bought a farm or they bought, uh, my grandfather bought a little grocery store. But they wanted to get out of the mines. Most of them wanted to get out of the mines and get back above ground. Uh, they seem to dislike work in the open air. I cannot believe that. <laughs> the last one, they have not met with any great success in business enterprises and there are few rich persons among them, so we'll dispute that as we go on. Uh, this one's nice, Lithuanians in the USA. Um, Lithuanian immigrants came from a people of peasants in which all the rural values, strong ties to the land and nature were highly cultivated, the garden thing. An attachment to agriculture was one of the salient features of the Lithuanian character. No matter whether a Lithuanian coal miner lived in a house owned by the company or in one that he had purchased with his own money, this former Lithuanian peasant tried to recreate his vision of rural Lithuania by acquiring a small plot of land. Uh, Lithuanians in the USA is the book as to that. But that's the thing I remember the most when I was small, is when I was walking from my house to the Lithuanian school I went to, it was like every Lithuanian yard was like a little country. They had their, oh, every, everyone was beautiful. I would love to go visiting with my mother, her, the, her friends, because I would go out in those gardens and it was like you were in this miniature land. So that stayed with me all my life. And Clarence Darrow, I think you know who he was. Um, he was the big attorney for the coal miners when they had the 1902 <coughs> strike. Uh, right here in Scranton. That's where he defended the whole thing. I mean, the history here is just mind-boggling. It's astounding. And that, that there isn't more going on about these incredible things is amazing. I visited their houses together with the commission. These people are closer to nature and than does our nation. They possess nobility and kindness of heart. That's what he had to say about the Lithuanians. That's beautiful. <coughs> An important aspect of the way in national character, character, the tradition of helping neighbors and of cooperative assistance, the word is talka, T-A-L-K-A for that. Uh, and you just wind up helping each other out. They had more boarding houses than any new immigrants. People used to make fun of them. But they got along, and that's how they helped each other out. These are, this is the anthracite mining death toll. Uh, this you can find in the Anthracite Museum. I took a picture of it. From 1870 to 1949, uh, 30,068, and then 837 up to 1993, is that? And there's the grand total. This breaks it down into ethnicity. Uh, from 1900 to 1920, they used ethnicity. And the Polish were the largest number that, that died in the mines during those 20 years. Uh, <coughs> Americans second and Lithuanians 1,999. That's also in the Anthracite Museum. In spite of the 1969 law that increased coal mine safety requirements, more than 76,000 coal miners throughout America died of black lung disease between 1968 and 2014. Now that's, that's since the coal mines closed. This is just still coal mines that are operational. So we think it's over, but you still have black lung. 
the culture, the main, main centers of culture were the churches. Clubs, associations, holidays. Um, Hearts of Fire was a play I wrote about Lithuanian culture by a, a woman who was a social worker with a lot of the Lithuanians, E.S. Johnson. These are some uh, little snippets from newspapers that give you an idea of the kind of things that they did. Uh, this is 1893 uh, Plymouth newspaper. The Lithuanians on Sunday held a meeting in this place celebrating the 10th anniversary of the printing of their first paper in English type. Delegates came from Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Britain, and Waterbury, Connecticut. This happened in Plymouth. Do you see how excited they got about a newspaper? <laughs> because they couldn't have them. And, and what are we saying about newspapers today? Uh, this is uh, one of the earliest newspapers. Came out of, I believe, Wooksbear, Draugus, which means friend. Uh, they, their first issue had a poem on the front. Like I said, they're, they're a very, um, I don't know, poetic people to me. And this is December 31st, 2017, Draugus, the culture section, picture of the garden. We had a couple Lithuanians come and they put the garden on their international website for people to come and visit the garden as one of the sites for Lithuanian tourists. And this year, two Lithuanian tourists, in addition to these people, got in touch and wanted to see it. So I love that idea. It's honoring, uh, <coughs> it's honoring Lithuanians. These are some more of the books they printed. Plymouth, Shenandoah. These are printing presses they had all over the place. You see this one on the left, Danos Songs. The first book they printed when they came here was a songbook. This is another printing place. That's the building still standing in Mahanoy City. Shaolin was a newspaper that came out of Mahanoy City. Again, these are just some of the uh, editors for these newspapers, Shemokin, Nicholas Varauskas, Plymouth, Pouchtis, Mahanoy City, Bukowskis, Wilkes-Barre, Kaupas, Barpas, Burba, a lot of them. Lithuanian Educational Society, here again. These are people that knew what it meant not to have a newspaper, not to have a book. So when they got here, education was extremely important. The Lithuanian Educational Society of the United States met at Mount Carmel on Tuesday, November 29th. There were present from this locality, Bur Reverend Burba of Plymouth, president of the society, Sylvester Pouchtis, Edwardsville, treasurer, 400 delegates present. Do, do you understand the, 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 the fever they had to have these things that we just think are, are not that important? Um, Plymouth again, 1892. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Sylvester Pouchtis. Application for charter. This was for, I believe, the church, the building of the church. Oh no, maybe just for the society. He had to apply for charters for your different clubs and organizations, especially if you were collecting money to, to, for different purposes. I found this interesting, Parade of Sorrow. Lithuanians commemorate the massacre of their fellow countrymen in Russia. Uh, this was a famous, uh, they got together and they were demonstrating against Russia and they were mowed down. Kajai massacre. So the people here in the United States made a parade in the parade by the Lithuanians of Luzerne County in protest against the persecution and massacre of their brethren by the Russians took place yesterday afternoon. A thousand members of the Lithuanian society lined up on public square, paraded down South Main Street to Trinity Church near the convent. I mean, I find this stuff amazing when, when you think about, I mean, something happened over in Lithuania. And, and they had to have this huge protest over here. Lithuanians of Plymouth and vicinity will hold an indignation to express their feeling in regard to the shooting at Latimer. I mean, listen, look, at, look at the community involvement of these people. I mean, they just didn't sit back. They just 
you know what Latimer was, I don't have to tell anybody about that. Because Lithuanians got shot there too. That was 1897. This is an interesting quote. Uh, a lot of people attribute it to Jay Gould, who was the big railroad guy, and he started in Gouldsboro. That's where he had his first tannery. That's where he got his initial money. And, uh, pardon me? I said that's some sentence. Oh, hire one half the working force to kill the other half, yeah. But he pretty much did a good job at that. He broke up a lot of strikes. Um, he also, he, it, it just, if you see the movie Toast of the Town, you'll see about Black Friday, these guys were all involved in that. How they manipulated the stock market and then they betrayed each other to get rich. I mean, it's, it's on a Turner Channel a lot, Toast of the Town, fascinating movie. And I think Cary Grant is in it. It's, it's a really good movie, entertaining. But as you're watching it, it's a great way to learn history. Uh, the other element, let's see, I'm not sure what paper this was, I don't think you have a little different. Labor demonstrations during the Carbondale Semi-Centennial Jubilee. 2,000 came to hear President John Mitchell of the United Mine Workers, Mother Jones and union leaders such as Lithuanian and <coughs> Scavage, who gave a speech in Lithuania. So, they have a nice article about John Mitchell, and then when they get to the Lithuanians, they call it the other element. So it's, it's, it's really, you see how you can try and divide people. <coughs> From village to parish, these are the way they kind of do this. They have the boarding houses, the church, choir, band, printing presses. It's pretty much me saying what I said. Uh, these are just some names of some of the important people, Berba, Pisa. These people all came up here, by the way, too, because I looked up about Alexander Berba and I looked up about Miklos Pisa, and they traveled up to Forest City before you even had churches and, and did masses in homes and things like that. <coughs> That's the church I went to. It's uh, St. Joseph's in Scranton. The building next to it on the right was the Lithuanian school I went to. Uh, that's just a seal proposal about building in 1894. Is it still in use? It has now become an Anglican church. Really? Yeah, it's become a, it's no longer called St. Joseph's, it's called St. Thomas More. This is a list of the churches in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, if it has D, that means it was destroyed, okay? And that particular year that's highlighted in red, uh, a lot of them are empty or for sale, and a lot of them, uh, if they exist, they were combined. None are just Lithuanian anymore, with the exception of one, Divine Providence in Scranton, which is under the auspices of the Polish National Church. Mm -hmm. It has a Polish <coughs> priest. Um, that's why I thought, this, this is so beautiful. Are you kidding me? This, the churches still need to bring people together somehow. An historical society is perfect. Um, this is an advertisement for St. Casimir's Church in Lin Linwood that I put out. Property <coughs> is a vacant owner user. There's a description of it. I put these two in just to show you what happens to some of the churches. The one on the left is in Pittsburgh, and people have told me they've been at this one. Uh, where the altar was is where they brew the beer now in the big I've vats. There. Were you there? I've been there. <laughs> it's been there. <laughs> so you see how the you beer is pretty good. <laughs> I'd much rather a historical society. <laughs> but I did, in my defense, I did not know I was a former Lithuanian church. So oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure it was Lithuanian. In fact, I don't think it was. Okay. I don't think it was Lithuanian, but it was a Roman Catholic church. Uh, that one there is in Wilkes-Barre, and it's going to be a brewery, too. Brewery, Yeah. Now, I just put this in, because I, just to contrast, I went to Lithuania to try and find family and all of that, and I did find the church where my Karolius, my, my grandfather, went. And I did see a name. They had this gigantic book in front of the church. And the priest went in there, said the name. He goes right in the book, and he 
opens the page and points. I mean, it was just, I, I just could not believe. Somebody had to tell him I was coming. <laughs> he couldn't possibly have done that. But he pointed to my great-grandfather's name. This is the church. Look at the date, 1878. Look at the condition of that church. I just, I'm just astonished between the breweries and this. You know, I mean, that's wood. That's just a little wooden, well, it isn't too little. It's quite large, actually. And it's absolutely gorgeous and in perfect shape from 1878. That's well over 100. I mean, and then we can't keep them for how long? So I hope this lasts as a historical society forever. Uh, this is just some pictures, again, of different uh, court groups. This is from, I think, uh, I don't have any. What town? I'm going to give you more Anthony's. Yeah. Do you? Freeland, I believe. Or, or Hazleton. Oh, that's Freeland. Oh, Freeland. Freeland? It's a choir. Choirs were extremely important. Choir on the left, I believe. This is a, one of the types of things they did, and this was in, I'm trying to look for the town again real fast. I don't want to have to read all of these to you. They start a cafe or a bar. First bar in Freeland. Freeland again, yeah. I was trying to find pictures of the businesses. Now, I, how many people knew that Bartels was owned by a Lithuanian? In Wilkes-Barre, well, Edwardsville, really, but he had a couple of mini breweries. Uh, guess who it was? Pouch this. His son became your priest. <laughs> he actually had two priests. He had two priests. Two of them became priests. And uh, and they used the professor as a as a gimmick, kind of, too, even in those days. So it's, it's really an incredible story. He was a coal miner. Sylvester Pouch this came over was a coal miner. He went up to Syracuse after he saved enough money, bought, first he had a grocery store, but then he went up to Syracuse with the brewery up there and got, uh, got the brewmeister or whatever to, to come down here and paid a certain amount of money to start the operation. This operation outlasted the original operation in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. We had a tavern. We never had that here. Bartels. You probably had Bartels. your local, probably my local. These are pictures, some pictures of the old buildings in Edwardsville. I can't say whether or not they're still standing. It's a beautiful building. There's some of the buildings of the brewery. Hmm. Big operation. Yeah. Premises of the Bartels Brewing Company, Edwardsville, near wilkes -Barre. Was eventually sold to the Lion Brewery. Oh, okay, that's why. It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's uh, two, that one quote I showed you before where they said Lithuanians didn't know how to do business. Well, uh, Pouch just did a great job with Bartels, if you ask me. Groblik, I don't know if anybody ever heard of Groblik's Dairy down the Wilkesbury line. Mm -hmm. My parents used to drive me all the ways down there to get ice cream. I mean, he was a huge dairy man. And then, of course, you see they were wanted one man to work on a farm. Let's the way you prefer. <laughs> so they said they loved the coal mines, but they, also, they knew they also loved to work. And that's a Tunis sign right by uh, the intersection of Finch Hill. They sell their food there. It's very good. Yeah, I don't see this Oh, yeah, I know it's Oh, yeah, I know it's Okay. See, I don't even know everybody. Remembering past Lithuanian days, those were huge. The biggest one was at Lakewood Park. And these are just some old pictures of that. Lakewood. Where's Lakewood Park? I think it's at Schuylkill County near Mahanoy City. Oh, <laughs> now, the last ones have been held. They used to be at the Frackville Mall. And now I think it's in a church in Frackville. It's pretty small. And then we also had them at Rocky Glen. 
Oh, yeah. I don't know if anybody remembers yep. going to those, but yeah. I went to those with my parents. <laughs> These are just some Lithuanian holidays. Uh, and I don't know if there's, oh, this is funny. Oh, well, we had been chosen in Pittston last year, but the candle, I got a kick out of the candle, and I can't read it. Boilo. Boilo, the smell of the liquor that the, the homemade liquor that the Lithuanians make, it's called Boilo. Has anybody had that? No. Then you have to go to a Kuchos. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, a, it's got a lot of spices in it. <laughs> that was the Kuchos that we had. <laughs> they have the Paisanki they call Marguche. These are cut paper art and they have the straw ornaments. And uh, Plakeli is what they call it in Polish. Kaladaitis is what they call it in Lithuanian at Christmas time. And that? then Zeppelina. Has anybody had Zeppelina? No, that's That'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had it in Lithuanian and oh my god, it's the heaviest thing I ever ate. It's a potato, like, well, inside is meat. Ooh, it's, it's meat so inside covered oh. with potatoes and it's boiled but they're so heavy but that's then they have a, a, a pitcher of gravy not gravy bacon and bits bacon covered. and fat and little oh, okay. bacon bits <laughs> they pour it on you have no arteries <laughs> left when you're <laughs> but everybody lives to be a hundred over there yeah. like, i hope i have those jeans yeah. i mean <laughs> They're delicious. I'm not saying they're not delicious, but they are powerful. <laughs> this was something quite beautiful in Lithuania that they're doing ever since they got accepted to the European Union. Um, they have a fire festival in the fall, which goes back to ancient traditions. But now it's, if they put these designs that are on their weavings along the river in candles, and they float them on the river in candles. It's just so beautiful. And then they have all kinds of singing. Um, the Baltic Way, the singing revolution, I'm trying to think if I have that in the other slides. No, I don't, I think. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, this is one of the reasons I'm so pleased about Lithuania and what they're doing today. The Baltic Way is called the singing revolution, and Latvia, Estonia, it started in Estonia, but the three of them went together. They made two million, maybe I have a picture. No, I don't. Two million people standing in a line. You can go online, I can go online too, but we don't want to take too much time. You can go online, look up the singing revolution. Two million people stood in a line from Estonia through Latvia into Lithuania and sang. Wow. And held hands through those three yeah. countries. Um, it was the silent revolution. It was a silent, their, well, it was a singing, singing revolution. revolution, excuse me. They had no violence, they had no violence, but they were telling Russia, you're not going to stop us. They sang their old folk songs, they sang their religious songs, they sang their patriotic songs. Uh, the, the video about it, if you just look it up on, on uh, YouTube, YouTube, it is just, you start crying. I, I mean, I brought the film to the Anthracite Museum. I mean, I have a hard time watching it, the, the passion of these people. When the Russian soldiers were coming to, to go into the Seamus, which is like their Congress, to take it over, all the people stood around the building and, and just stood there and sang against, against the soldiers. And they didn't take it. So it's just, it's, they're amazing stories. You have to see it to believe it. And that's recent. This is in the night, this is 1990. Right around 1990. So I did an Equinox thing trying to imitate the Lithuanian thing with Marie Lasky, who's going to be here in full Lithuanian regalia on Saturday. Um, we did a thing honoring her husband who worked to uh, restore fish to uh, Leggett's Creek, which goes into uh, the Lackawanna River. In <coughs> Uh, and this is interesting, because my mother told me about, we were in this area called Sweeney's Beach, and we had a bonfire. We didn't have the big display like the Lithuanians did, but we had a little bonfire. And uh, my grandmother, my mother told me she remembers when the KKK burnt the crosses on the calm dumps in this area where we had this ceremony. So, so for me, 
it, it was so meaningful for me to have this ceremony and, st and, and burn a little campfire instead of something that's filled with hate. Uh, this was just a little bit more about that. There's the pattern, and that's called the Diamond Rose. And I love that name, the Diamond Rose, and it's in my, it's in my, it's the weaving pattern in my grandmother's sash. And I love it because we had the black diamond, and I like to think of the Diamond Rose. And uh, my mother's roses are growing in the garden, and the Diamond Rose is on here. Where that ceremony was held is where the diamond coal mine was in Scranton, which was one of the first coal mines. My grandfather worked there. So all these things are woven together. I mean, this is a weaving, and these, this, that's my weaving, kind of, in a way. That's my grandmother uh, with, with the rose. She grew gorgeous roses. That's the picture of the garden. That's when we had the 10th anniversary. I love this medal that was designed by Petros Rimsa, and it says, we are for peace. It was designed in 1949. There's a couple of pictures of the singing revolution. The Baltic Way the singing revolution. And this is a picture of my granddaughter, who is much bigger now, and my grandson, who's also much bigger. But they asked for a couple Lithuanian artifacts for the, for the Everhart Museum. I always dreamt of my grandmother's work being displayed in the museum, and it finally was. And I just was, it did so, it made me feel so good to have my grandkids, you know, go to the museum and see my grandmother's uh, artwork there. So that's really the last slide in this. Now, if you're not finished, if you're still not too bored, I can, um, Peggy asked me to show some of the things that I have on my website about Forest City. I mean, would you want me to do that, or yeah. mm -hmm. enough's enough? Okay, let's go to that. If I could figure out how to get out of this. Now, what did we do to get here? You? Yeah. There we go. Back to this. Okay. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see better. This is on the website, and you can go to it any time. Cool. Uh, the Kashushka Healing Garden, that's the name of the garden down there. And I like the idea of healing garden because we're trying to heal. Excuse me. All right, I'll go through this quick. We're running out of time. We need to tell. People don't know, but once you get me talking, forget it. You gotta pull the button. I mean, he knows already. They did that once on me already. Uh, okay, let's see. I will just do it this way. Let's see. No, I want to get to Forest City here. There you go. Okay. Okay. <coughs> It could be twice as good. That's a line from Benedict's, Benedict, you know, Bernadette Slick's book right here. That's a line from her book. That's where I found it. But this is the city in the forest. Okay. Now, Peggy wanted me to play this, but I'm sorry. I think we're going to just go through this super quick because we have a play rehearsal coming up. And uh, go to YouTube and see, or go to my website and watch <laughs> this. It, it's really incredible. Anthony Slick, it's him talking about being a breaker boy. No. There was the other Anthony. So this is just pictures. I'm just going to go through this really fast. There's a lot of articles on here about Forest City. <coughs> Yeah, and I'm going to add more because Peggy has more. If, if you give me my, your permission, I'm going to put more on this. Let, you know, I'd like to put the other picture. I need your permission to do that. Uh, talks about the building, about some of the clubs. I like this one about blueberry picking. Forest City Correspondent says this is, this is 1897. This is the season of the year when the huckleberry picker has his, 
has his innings, I don't know, and at no time, even the memory of the oldest inhabitant has the crop been larger or of, of better quality on the whole oh, farm. So yeah, sure you still have them up here, but they used to love to do that, and I used to always do that. Mm -hmm. Sports, we're sitting down, St. Joseph's Alps. But Wayne and Dave here was at Newton Lake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of your yeah, great groups. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the a left wing that was killed in the mines. When 600 mine, miners were thrown out of work. So you can enjoy yeah. this at your leisure. I like this picture because yeah. that's what that picture is from the government. I think it's circa 1937. And that's what it looked like. That's what it looks like on the right today. There's a lot. This is population on the left. United Mine Workers. Here's about uh, when the commission came to Forest City. And this is an article on the right is about a little Lithuanian boy that took on asking the commissioners a bunch of questions. And this, this real fast. You guys have a guy here, Frank Mast was his name originally, uh, Boleslaw Mastowskis. He was very close to um, Woodrow Wilson, worked very hard for Lithuanian independence. So this is a picture of him going to Switzerland with the people that Woodrow Wilson's group organized to try and make sure Lithuania got to be free. And Boleslaw, I can't, he has, he's the first one I think on the right. Boles must be. But it's really Frank Mast now. Well, he's deceased now, but John the Dias, too. I was for I'll end with this. There, there's even more. I was very fortunate to meet him before he died. And what a gentleman. And if you get a chance, if you want to read something that's gripping, wrong place, wrong time, anybody read this book, read it. And you'll see the suicide mission he went on and came back from, even after being a prisoner of war and escaping. Just, it should be a movie. <laughs> it's just an, an incredible story. And John Gaditis used to dig potatoes on the land that I now have with Edward Rudball. So it's, that's, I mean, I, I'm very passionate about the area. I'm passionate about preserving the land and the history. And, uh, you know, please go to the website and take your time, and hopefully I'll add more. There's even additional pages on there. One additional page. And I appreciate your attention. That they got to transfer this over to somebody else. Uh, right. Thanks, right. thanks for being such a great audience. Right. Cheryl, I'm sorry, sorry, I had to cut you off. This is the second time this has happened to you, isn't it? Everybody cuts me off. <laughs> I'd like back. to thank Carol again. Oh, another round of applause, please. <laughs> that will conclude our program for tonight. But before you leave, we have some kolache for everyone. <laughs> if you don't know what.